I, I must say, you're very well behaved. I wish all of my lectures uh, were like this. Now, can everybody hear me up the back there? I've, I've got a microphone on, but... Oh, it seems to have stopped working. All right, hopefully... Oh, yes, here we go. Look, thanks for coming along this morning. Um, there's lots of demands on people's times these days, uh, time these days, so it's great that you've given up your Saturday to come along and find out a little bit more about uh, the, uh, the engineering faculty, and in particular, electrical engineering during uh, this uh, half hour presentation. My name is Mark Andrews. I've worked in the department for about 30 years. And what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about electrical engineering uh, where it came from, what it can do, uh, where we're going in the future, and hopefully um, uh, convey some of the reasons why I find it an extremely fascinating field of study, and why I think perhaps you should as well. Not just for sort of intellectual stimulation and giving your lives a purpose, but also because you can make a real difference in the world, you can do something quite purposeful. So I've, the, uh, the title of the talk is fairly grandiose, but um, I think it's accurate. If we have a look at the, uh, the four fundamental forces in nature, gravity, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force, these are basically all the forces that we know about. There's only two that affect our daily lives. One is gravity, right? We're all sitting down. We're not floating around in this room. And the other is the electromagnetic force. You can see me, thanks to electromagnetism. Uh, you probably drove here in a car that these days relies uh, critically on electricity. Right? The room is lit, thanks to electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is, is so pervasive that we don't even know that it's around. Right? You don't know, you don't even think about the supply of fresh water to your house until it's not there. Right? Suddenly, what do you do? How do you wash? Similarly, you don't even think about the electricity supply in your house until it's not there. Right? That's almost the very de definition of something being pervasive. But somebody's got to you know, work in the background doing those things. And oftentimes it's those sorts of uh, almost mundane applications that are the most critical. But I don't want to dwell on those today. We want to, we want to um, talk about a few more things. So we only feel gravity and the electromagnetic force it turns out of the eight fundamental equations that describe classical physics, four of them are connected with electrical things. Thank you. That's how important electricity is. Now you might say to yourself, well, what about mechanical forces, for example? You know, look, there's a dirty little secret that I will share with you, and that is there are no mechanical forces. There are only electrical forces between atoms. Okay? That's how important it is. Now, if we just briefly <clears throat> go back in time, that's quite a way, isn't it? 1831 to 1879, this guy, James Maxwell, we, in electrical engineering, all look up to him. He was a brilliant uh, physicist, actually, and he brought together everything that was known at the time about um, electrical and magnetic phenomena. At the time, it was thought that these things were all quite different. There was electrostatics and electrical things, and you could, you, know, you could rub a piece of amber and pick up little pieces of paper. You could put a lodestone in a bucket, and that would always point in the same direction, you know, magnetic north. He was able to realize that all of these things are just different sides of the same object, and, um, and he pulled them all together in a seminal work, which resulted in his um, famous, what we call Maxwell's equations. Now, everybody told me not to present any mathematics. Now, normally that's a good idea, but look, these equations are just so beautiful that I can't help but show them to you, okay? Now, there's only a few of them, and now they, they also don't sort of roll off the tongue like E equals MC squared, but they're so much more important to us living on planet Earth. So here they are. Ah. Oh. Aren't they gorgeous? <laughs> now, believe it or not, these four equations underpin pretty much all of electrical engineering. 
We don't want to go into what they mean, but E happens to be connected with uh, voltage, and B happens to be connected with magnetism. And then we've got, you can see that B and E are in the same equation. So somehow magnetism is connected with voltage, and this was his great insight and brilliance. And in centuries to come, we will look back on the 19th century and recognize that Maxwell did us all a huge favor by um, uh, integrating all of the knowledge into one set of equations. So these are the equations that you learn about as an undergraduate electrical engineer. And they really do have profound effects. They not only describe how things like cell phones work and the antenna in the cell phone, and like if I pull out my humble cell phone here and I were to call my grandmother, uh, how is it that the electricity gets out of here and into an antenna on the street and then somehow, you know, makes its way to wherever she happens to be, whether she's sitting at home or whether she's driving on the motorway or, or whatever. We've got Maxwell to thank for that. <clears throat> CubeSats, something modern. CubeSats, tiny little satellites that we can put into orbit around the Earth that students can develop. Students, our students are developing, right? and using electronics that they can comprehend, that they learn about as undergraduates, all of that thanks to Maxwell's equations. Even exciting applications like this are uh, fine, but Maxwell's equations also describe the humble microwave oven and the electric toothbrush. Maxwell's equations describe how electricity is generated in uh, Benmore in the South Island and makes its way all the way up here, right into this room, to the power points that are in this room. Okay, so there is a single unifying theme in electrical engineering, namely Maxwell's equations. We exploit all of the um, great results that we've been able to derive from a careful consideration of those equations. And even though they're just four simple equations that we can write on a piece of paper or indeed put on a t-shirt, those equations are still giving up their secrets today. Maxwell's equations have been true for the best part of 13.8 billion years. There's no sign of them uh, giving us any wrong answers uh, in, the, in the future either. So what has Maxwell's equations led to? Well, this. These are all the different things that nominally fall under the category of electrical engineering. If you travel around different universities, you get to study different subsets of this list of topics. No university can teach all of electrical engineering, and, um, uh, and we are no different. These are the sorts of topics that we cover in our undergraduate program, but you see, you can't do everything. But then nor do we try to do everything. One of the most important things about being uh, an electrical engineer, or an engineer in general, is it's also almost become trite these days, but it's you have to learn how to learn. What, the one discipline which changes more rapidly than all others, I think, is electrical engineering. Okay? It's so pervasive. The technology, the underpinning theory that gets developed is changing all the time. What I learned as an undergraduate when I was a student back in the 80s, right, um, that's only a tiny fraction of what students need to know today. So the most important thing that you will learn, apart from time management, getting your assignments in on time, is uh, how to learn by yourself. So when you go out into the real world, you won't be phased by being given a problem that you've never seen before. right? You will have developed a set of skills that will allow you to solve those problems anyway. So, electronics, electrical engineering. I claim that electronics is pervasive, right? Now, I've, drawn, I've got a picture here of a washing machine. Dishwashers these days, we've come a long way from beating cloths on river rocks. Now everything is, is automated. Um, we want to be told when the washing is finished. Pretty soon we'll be told, we'll be notified on our cell phones. In fact, I believe there's some models out there already that will, will let you know when the, sorry, when the dishwasher is done, uh, not to mention the laundry and all those other things. <coughs> We've got smartphones. 
It's hard to believe there was a world before smartphones, right? And we just take it for granted that uh, the entire world's knowledge is in the palm of our hands, right? Now, when that entire revolution was happening, it seemed amazing. Now we just take it for granted. Of, of course I've got the world's knowledge in the palm of my hand. Why wouldn't I, right? It's very easy to get blasé. There's some more revolutions coming. One, of course, cars. Cars are already heavily dependent on electronics. Electric vehicles will be even more so. Automated vehicles that drive themselves or assist you as a driver, they're just around the corner. Lots of these problems have not yet been solved. I'll be retiring soon. We need young people to come in and start working on these problems, <coughs> understand the technology, make their own contributions to society, right? That's what it's about. And in doing so, hopefully that will bring purpose to your life and also make a contribution to society as a whole. Right? That's, what, that's what enables me to get up in the morning, is if I really think that I'm making a difference and if I'm really enjoying what I do. That, you know, that if you can achieve that, then you're doing pretty well. What's happening in the department? Well, wireless electric vehicle charging. We've got world leading experts working on this problem. Their solution is to have, um, um, in fact it's already been demonstrated, is to have um, coils embedded in the road and as the vehicle drives along, it's possible to have the electrical energy jump, if you like, 20 centimeters or more to the car and charge the car as it's driving along the road. Right? The technology is already there. What it requires is a political will, uh, massive investment, and an understanding that you know, this, is the, this has to be the way of the future. Automated transportation. <clears throat> right? We've all seen the, the good and bad stories about um, automated vehicles. Right? Bad stories, is, I mean, it, it gets, it's as bad as it can get, right? Somebody can be killed while being driven around by a robot, essentially. So that's not good. But then if you have a look at the history of uh, the development of aeroplanes, right? That had a similarly fraught past. I, I can't believe you're leaving. <laughs> Never mind, you are the enlightened ones. <laughs> Some more terms that you've probably heard bandied about. The Internet of Things. Why does this even matter? A lot of times in the press you see what I think are fairly trivial applications, like the one I just mentioned before. Wouldn't it be great if my cell phone told me when my laundry was done, right? Well, no, not really. I could just walk to the laundry and see if it's done, right? But there are much better ways of doing things. And it's not always obvious why. Once we have more information, there are, we have more options for solving problems. This is a recurring theme. With the more telemetry we have, the more information we have about how something operates, whether it's as simple as a smart home, or as complicated as a smart city, you can start to do really interesting things. Right? Vehicles today are so much more efficient than they were 50 years ago. Why? Largely because of developments in engine management technology. What does that mean? It means electronics, by and large. Right? We couldn't have the efficiencies that we have today without smart technology in vehicles. That sort of revolution is going to now take place throughout society. Transportation systems that can react to congestion. Smart cities that can detect pollution and congestion in the public uh, transport system. All sorts of things. Developments in um, medicine. I think the New Zealand, I don't know what its name is, I'm just going to call it the New Zealand... No, I'm not going to call it that. Whoever it is, who's, whoever's job it is to hang on to blood samples that we always give when the doctor needs to check something. We've got hundreds of millions of those. If we were able to get access to those and analyze them, there's all sorts of medical 
uh, results, medical advances that can potentially be made by having access to all of that information. Once you've got information and you look at it carefully, you can make smart decisions. And that might be something as uplifting as you know, finding a new cure for something, or it might be just you know, making the trains run more efficiently. Electric trains, of course. Which brings us to something like data engineering. Data engineering, big data. You may have heard of those buzz phrases. Once you've got a lot of data, you can use various mathematical techniques to look for patterns, look for behaviors in the data that you wouldn't normally see. Information will be the key in the future. The information will be gathered and analyzed using electronics. Everything will, is going uh, the electronic way. Civil engineers need electronics. Engineering scientists need electronics. Right? The job for the electrical engineer is not going to disappear in the future. It's not the sort of job that can be taken over by a robot. Smart cities we've already um, touched on. There's a lot of promise in what's possible to do with a smart city. Again, a smart city is a label that really covers stuff like the Internet of Things, big data. Once we've got access to what we call telemetry, information, what's happening? Are the trains running on time? Is there enough water in the water supply? Um, is there any pollution down at the docks? All this sort of information can be used to run cities much more efficiently. That's going to have to happen, right? Because you know, the population is, is always increasing. Again, so jobs for electrical engineers. Now, those things are happening now. There are other things that are in the future. Here's a little glimpse into the future. This is what is called ultra-dense memory. It's one million times more compact than the CD. Now, these days, young people hardly know what a CD is because everything is streamed from Spotify or Apple Music. But a CD is that sort of shiny silver platter that your parents have <laughs> that they don't do anything with anymore. And that gives you about 40,000 billion bits per square centimetre. So you could have your entire life recorded on some of this sort of memory. Why? I don't know. But we all know from things like Big Brother and what are those other trash TV programs? I can't remember the names of. But there's a market out there. You know, somebody will watch the banal and dreary life of somebody else if it's on television. So you too could record your entire life and, I don't know, charge people to watch you having your dinner or whatever. Now, there is a flip side to this. I first presented this picture, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. And the great promise was that it's just around the corner. Well, it's still just around the corner. So sometimes, because this stuff works in the laboratory, but there's a big difference between having something working in the laboratory and being able to mass produce it. Who would we need in order to make that transition from laboratory demonstration to mass market commercialization? Electrical engineers, of course. Just so you know, each one of these bits, right, so a bit, in case you didn't know, we, we don't use the decimal number system in computer systems, right, we use binary, so things are one and zero. Each one of these little gold dots is a one, and the space between them is a zero. That's how it's interpreted. Each one of those is an atom. So this is basically as dense as you can get. The information density is, a, is about as dense as DNA, um, and it's also kind of slow at extracting information, a little bit like DNA. But, you know, there's some promise here. Maybe it will never work out, but that's okay. The point is that these developments are happening all the time, and we need electrical engineers to make it so. Here's another one that I touted uh, about the same time as my ultra-dense memory. Ballistic transistors that had electrons firing around, flying around inside. That doesn't even matter what that is. I've got a zero and a one. It's binary. The main thing is this thing here, speed measured in terahertz. That's like a thousand gigahertz. That's a thousand billion 
oscillations per second. That's much, much faster. That's like a thousand times faster than a PC today. Again, eight years ago, this was just around the corner. And it's still just around the corner. <laughs> but maybe in another eight years, when I'm giving this talk at my retirement, uh, I'll be able to say something other than it's just around the corner. So let's just briefly have a look at the degree that I think you should all do, and that is in electrical and electronic engineering. That's a degree offered within the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. We also offer other degrees, computer systems engineering and software engineering. And they have separate talks that you can go to and learn about those. If, if, you're, if you like this, then this is the sort of career that would be good for you. Electrical engineers, in fact, engineers in general, they like to solve problems. It's an innately satisfying experience when you can solve a problem that other people can't, or people rely on you to find a solution to something. So if you like solving problems, this will be a good career for you. You get to apply scientific knowledge to human needs. Right? Science tends to come up with uh, a way to exploit new physical phenomena, and engineers turn those ideas into products. And if you don't mind the notion of spending your entire lifetime learning and learning new things, and personally, I find it extremely invigorating, I can't imagine anything worse than having to do the same type of job every day of the week. Right? As an electrical engineer, you won't do that. Things change all the time. And instead of it being a burden, I personally see it as a, as a great opportunity. So within the department, these are the sorts of specializations that you can follow if you want to. Okay, there's quite a few things there. I'll just quickly, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll just briefly go over these. Computer systems, robotic systems, and software engineering, they're responsible for things like digital hardware and the software that either runs on it or communicates with it, that sort of thing. You can see examples of that. Uh, downstairs in the display area. Electronic systems and power systems. These, uh, you've probably seen these flashing lights stuck in the road, technology developed here. The other technology that was developed here, uh, the um, wireless charging developed in this department, recently sold to Apple. Okay, that's going to be appearing in the new iPhones. It's all about the transfer of power. Control systems, also connected with robotics, but also electronic systems. How do, we, how do we design and build drones? How do we keep them up in the air? How do you measure things like acceleration, um, uh, that sort of thing, get, them, get the drone to where it needs to be? It's all electronics. Uh, every few years, this application pops up. Exoskeletal systems, not not all about you know, trying to make super soldiers, it's about trying to help people with disabilities. That's where the, sort of the real uh, value in the systems lies. And that tends to integrate a whole pile of different applications. Right? So you need to be quite broadly based when you're an electrical engineer. So that's all I wanted to say, really. I wanted to finish with this. We're having a part the, what we call a part four project research open day coming up in September. These are our final year students who will be showing off their projects. They work in pairs for the whole year. They've been working on a range of interesting problems. This is a, it's a Friday. You can come along in the afternoon, wander around, talk to the students, ask them how they've found the degree, did they have a good time, what they thought of it, and whether you should do it as well. So, in half an hour, I can only give you a whirlwind tour through what I think is a fascinating and but clearly enormous area. Now, we do have just a couple of minutes. Are there any questions you want to ask me? Yes. What is fuzzy logic? What is fuzzy logic? That's another one hour lecture. <laughs> in, in the remaining time, I could spell it for you. That's about it. Any other questions? Yes? If a student was interested in maths and physics, yes. what would you say about doing a BSc or doing an engineering degree? 
why not do both? Um, uh, depending on where you, where you go in electrical engineering, it, you, it can be either more or less mathematical. Um, I'm a strong believer in doing as much maths as possible, right, because um, it's, it's good for you, right? It's character building. <laughs> it is. I always do at least, at least four sums in the morning before coming to work. <laughs> so now when, when the students are starting out, you know, three years for a science degree and then four years for engineering, that's an awfully long time. What I don't realize is that that time goes so quickly. And of course, when you look back, like three years ago to me, now that I'm an old man, three years in the past seems like yesterday. Uh, three years in the future always seems much longer. My ideal, if I, was, if I had my time again, I would do maths and physics, and then I would do engineering. So it's a very pertinent question, because I think the, the more uh, knowledge you have about fundamentals will only strengthen your engineering understanding. Good questions. Any others? All right, well, look, I'm going to be standing outside if anybody wants to have a chat afterwards. Thank you very much for coming along, and I'll see you around.